This past summer, one of the great vacations we've ever, greatest vacations we've ever taken was to go to um, Glacier National Park. And Marla knew from Facebook that one of her friends from high school, she hadn't seen in like 30 years, was a fly fishing guide. And she thought, hey, we'd love to get together with you and your wife while, while, while we're up here. He said, we can do better than that. I'm going to bring my brand new river fishing boat and take you out for two days to teach to fly fish if you'd like that. We said, great, we're going to learn to fly fish on one of these great moving rivers. And uh, he splits it over two days because he only has room for two people at a time. And he, uh, Luke and I get the first day. It happens to be a day where the fly fishing is not good. He says, it doesn't look like a good fly fishing day. But he teaches us how to fly fish. So we're on the shore first before we get in the boat. He's showing us exactly how to do it, how you take the fly rod, you take it to 11 o'clock, and you stop, and then you take it back to 1 o'clock, and then that loop goes way back, and it whips itself back around, and then you whip it down, and it flows out like this, and the fly lands on the water last. I found myself doing that 11 o'clock, 1 o'clock, whoosh. And I was so happy to watch that fly land on the water and not in my cheek. <laughs> because when I was a 12-year-old, I had a friend who thought it a great idea to fly a kite on a, uh, on a fishing hook, on a fishing pole, and twirl it around up in the air, and he hooked me in the face. And for 20 years, I had a scar there, just under my eye. I thought it was so fun, so amazing, this, this new art of doing this. And, and we went out on the river, and I thought I was doing great. But Marla's friend is a gentle, loving human being. He broke me in easily, one bit at a time, in all the ways I was doing it wrong. For one thing, I was going to 11 o'clock, and I wasn't going to 1 o'clock. I was doing like my golf swing. I was taking it way too far back to like 5 o'clock. And when I do it in the golf swing, you know what happens. Two ball this way, this way, never this way. And so he corrected that. Then he said, the other thing is, you, you're, you, know, you, you need to check your line. You're checking the line. You've got to get that fly fishing line behind the fly because the fly is supposed to go first. So as soon as you land it, you flip it back with your wrist. And then the other thing he said later on was, you know, you're picking that fly up right where the fish should be, and that's not the time to pick it up. You're going to scare the fish away. And lastly, he says, you know, when I finally got a little nibble, I didn't get many nibbles. It was a bad fishing day. And I get a little nibble, I think, ah, you know, I would go, whoop. He said, Alan, this is not a marlin in the deep sea <laughs> or a shark. This is a little trout. You just go, doop. Well, Luke, I'm watching Luke do it, has a beautiful cast. He's casting beautifully, just landing the fly. Luke catches two fish. The next day, Kira goes out, and she's never fly fished before. She teaches him on land, and uh, they get in the boat, and the first time she casts her line out, she lands a beautiful rainbow trout. She catches five more rainbow trout during the day. And I'm like, that's okay. It felt good just to be out there and to do this and to do this. And I thought, I'm pretty good that I'm beginning to learn how to fly fish. But what's the point of fly fishing? It's to catch fish. It's to end up with a fish that you can put in the boat. And we did catch and release, but maybe take home and have a great meal or cook on the side of the river, right? So I learned my lesson. And I learned something I think that we can learn from that story. It has an obvious parallel meaning. And the parallel meaning is that, you know, life is not just about figuring things out and being good at something in our heads. It's also about doing something good with our lives. It's not enough that when I go and I study the scriptures, that I have those wonderful aha moments that I, as someone who does theology and studies scripture, I just love to read the Bible and love to read something in a magazine or a book, and I go, ah, oh, wow, that really puts a whole new way of looking at it. It's wonderful. It's very important to have those things happen. And some people, Christian believers, don't do enough of that. But if that's all it does, it's not much. It's just a nice 
exercise in the mind. Christian belief is not enough. Coming to understand good theology is not enough. If it doesn't happen in our lives, it's not worth very much. Now, there's a transition. True transformation involves, uh, the, the ancient uh, mon mon monastics understood that true transformation involves different parts of ourselves. It involves the mind that hears and sees something new, that perceives the truth. It involves the heart that takes that thought that we've come and takes it down deep into our heart so it's something that's felt deeply. It involves the words where we speak our words. It involves doing something with it. All parts of it, the mind, the heart, the strength, all parts of it, of the living of the Christian faith. It's to be one thing. Now, let me give an illustration of that, and that's compassion. Compassion is one of the many attitudes of the heart, dispositions of the heart, that we are called to develop through worship and through Bible study and through praise and through learning from our neighbor and from doing things. We learn these deeper dispositions that we live out of in the Christian faith, and one of the most important ones is compassion. It happens to be one of the dispositions that we share with most of the major religions of the world. But compassion is not just feeling sorry for someone or feeling bad for someone. It starts out like that. I see someone suffering. I see someone in pain. I have pity for them. I, 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 I say a prayer for them. But is that all I do? I know you've had this experience. We've all done this. We've all felt bad for it. Driving along the road, someone's broken down on the side of the road. And we think, well, maybe I should stop. Maybe I should pull over and see if there's anything I can do to help them. They look like they've been stuck here for a while. I remember one time thinking, I don't know, all the reasons I don't want to do that. could be a trap, could be something bad, you know, I've I got to get somewhere. And I remember driving on, and as I was praying, someone went, help. Now, my father-in-law doesn't have fancy theology, I don't think. But there's something about his Christian faith that he's very good at. I have known that many times he has pulled over on the side of the road when he's seen someone pull back. He's passed them, pulled over, backed his car up, gotten and seen what they needed, gotten to the trunk of his car, and helped them get back on the road. Now, which one is more loving? You know the answer for that. And that's why we like the story of the Good Samaritan. It's the best story that illustrates exactly that point of compassion. It's a man who does everything he's supposed to do. He doesn't, just, he, he, he doesn't just experience the feeling and sentimentality and have pity for the person. He uses his whole self to involve. It's a story you know. I probably don't even need to explain it to you. It's a, it's a, it's a story that Susan explained to you quite well. But I, I want to say this. It sounds always like a joke to me. You know, you've, you've heard good religious jokes. You know how good religious jokes always have three people? There's three people. There's a where well, there's the pro, liberal Protestant minister. There's the uh, Catholic priest, and then there's the rabbi. And you know how it goes. The punchline is what the third person, right? Well, this joke sounds like that too. The crowd that heard this would have heard themselves being the man in the ditch, because they were the ones who understood what it was like going to Jericho. And how many people got mugged? Maybe they've been in the situation. They've known someone. They've certainly heard about someone. So they're the people in the ditch. And they hear the story. They hear, oh, Jesus is going to tell a story about him. And then, they, then Jesus says, well, there happens to be uh, the priest. He comes along. And they're thinking, oh, <laughs> Jesus is going to lay it on the priest here. And the priest oh, moves further away and walks on by. And they start laughing. Yeah, that's our priest, a bunch of hypocrites think there's somebody pompous with all their nice robes. And then the lay person who serves the month in the temple, that person, well, those people think they're high and mighty. There's something else to get to serve in the temple. And he said, they'll start to laugh because they think, oh, he's going to put those people in their place. And sure enough, he walks right by and everyone's laughing. Well, I wonder who the third person's going to be, the crowd thinks. I wonder who that third person's going to be. Oh, and Jesus has a smile on his face. And then there was a Samaritan. 
And the crowd is already chuckling because even though Jesus has not said anything, no, they know where this is headed. <laughs> the Samaritan who they hate more than anyone is really going to be the brunt of the joke. And Jesus says, the Samaritan came along and came closer. Oh, <laughs> he's going to kick him. And he reached down and he bandaged his wounds, poured wine on it, cared for him, put him on his own animal, took him to an inn and cared for him and then left money. He said, when I come back by, I'll give you more money if he needs more care. And that's the story. Do you get how that story involves not just the head, but the heart? That's splenista is the word of compassion in the Bible. It means a churning of a stomach, where we, by the way, have brain cells. The stomach churns, but it doesn't stop there. It's connected to the rest of him. He goes forth and cares because his motions are connected with his doing, his arms, his hands. I think about going to a movie. I saw The Color of Proper Purple when it came out in the movie theater. I went with a friend of mine. She's sitting next to me. There's that awful scene where uh, Suge gets knocked down the stairs by her brutal, abusive husband. And she gets so upset, she goes, bam, right on my leg. I go, whoa, what? It's, oh, I'm sorry. But for her, the emotions in her heart were connected with who she was, her hands. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And the story could end here, right? The example that we need to do rather than just think. But there's more. We always miss the part, the setting of the story. There's the guy who comes up to talk about what's happening. Remember the guy? He was a religious lawyer, a religious scholar. He's someone who really thinks about the issues of faith, as we should do, as we're glad we have people who do. And he comes up to Jesus and he says, Now, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know what he wants? He wants the Willy Wonka gold ticket to heaven. He wants the Willy Wonka gold ticket. He doesn't want to one day show up at the pearly gates, as we call it, and find that everybody else is going in and he doesn't have a ticket. What do I need to do to secure me a ticket? But now, I think when Jesus thinks about eternal life, he's not thinking about the golden Willy Wonka golden ticket. He's thinking about, he's thinking about a life that we begin to live now that has a sweetness that we don't have to wait for eternity to experience. It's something we can experience. And Jesus then, tell, uh, uh, then says, well... What do you think? He's a good lawyer. He, Jesus is a good rabbi. You asked her a question with a question. He knows this is a smart guy. He says, well, I think you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and uh, with your mind. And you should love your neighbor yourself. And Jesus says, great. You're wonderful. You got it right. That's exactly what I would have said. And it could end there. But thank God it doesn't. He wanted to justify himself. He said, well, now, here's another scholarly question that everyone's been asking. Who is my neighbor? Do you know what he means by that question? He means, where are the limits to my love? Who is it I owe an obligation to care for? And by implication, who are the people I don't really have to worry about? I can exclude. And there's all kind of laws about that in the Old Testament. You can't exclude the stranger because the stranger is coming to... There's all kind of laws about caring for the immigrant, for instance. But the enemy? Do I have to love my enemy? <laughs> Surely there's a line. I can't love everyone the same. You know what I mean by that? You ever think about that? You can't do love everyone. It's impossible. You've got to make some choices here. Well, who do I get to leave out when I make those choices? Because... Well, uh, well, charity begins where? Begins at home. What happens when um, churches have to make decisions in their budget giving? 
or where they spend their time investing. Well, you know, I've had this happen many times in church. They say, I think we ought to give our money to locally, and we ought to give it to the people that are near us because, well, we can't worry about all those people far off. So foreign mission always gets the bottom of the barrel. Well, there are people we don't know. There are strange people. We don't always know how the money is going to be used, but we know around here. So people do things like that. Well, let's draw the line there. But then, something else Barbara Brown Taylor pointed out in her sermon on this that I liked. There's that other thing we do. You know what else we do? We have a way of saying, well, let's talk about this. Let's get to the bottom of this. Let's get clarity before we do anything. We talk something to death. You ever do that? I don't know, there's this, and then there's this, and we should do this, maybe we should do this. We're sitting, and Marla and I are sitting and talking sometimes about how much we care about the environment, how much we love the environment. We can, well, what can we do for the, should, what should we do? Where should we spend our, how can we help with the environment? So we start to think about it. Well, should we put on uh, siding that's thicker when we put, we put on new siding in our house? Should we put extra insulation in the attic? Should we change the LED lights? Uh, should we get a, a, an electric car versus a gas car? And we're discussing all this. Should we write our senator and our representatives more than we write them about environmental issues? Should we join more than join Sierra Club? Should we send more money to the Sierra Club versus all the other things that we can send to? Or the, or the Environmental Defense League? Because you know something? The environment these days looks like that guy in the, in the ditch, left half dead. He's one of the people in the ditch. I don't know. And I say, well, Marla, look at what you do for a living. You fly for a living. Every flight you take burns more, way more energy than it costs. That one person will burn in their own, one person will burn in his own life or her own life. Well, I don't know. We don't do anything or don't do much. That's the problem. We get stuck in our minds. And we don't really know what we're going to do. And we don't get much done because, well, I got it. But the story of the Good Samaritan is about a man who simply lived here. He can't do everything. But sometimes when that part of him that gets caught in compassion, that gets stirred up inside himself, he's like my friend in the movie theater. It's connected with what his hands are going to do. He can't stop himself from doing it. Because he's integrated heart and mind and soul and his hands and his words. That's who this man is. He's one whole piece. And that's the beauty of the story. Because I have an idea that that man priest who knows everything and everything he's supposed to, probably knows the law better than anybody else. He's turning it in his mind as he walks. Well, it could be a trap. I've got other obligations to the temple. I've got to get through. I'll be late if I stop and help this man. And maybe the Levite's doing the same thing. He gets caught in his thoughts. He's thinking about what he needs to do. And maybe the lawyer, who's always asking the questions, gets thought in his theology, but never gets around to really living the faith. And so Jesus says, it's the Good Samaritan. One little other slight point that you might miss. What was the question the lawyer asked? Who is my neighbor? In other words, who should I be a neighbor to? What is my obligation? Jesus never answers that question directly. You know what he does? He tells a story about a man who is neighbor to me. Why does he do that? Because he wants us to know that if a man who is my enemy can be my friend, can have compassion, then there is no one I can exclude from my love. No one. There are no boundaries I can any longer draw. All I can do is live out of my heart and let my heart and the Spirit of God take the lead and choose those things that I know I must not only feel pity for, but I must take action for. And then the story ends.
You know how it ends? It ends with um, Jesus asking the lawyer. Now, who was a neighbor to the man in the dish? And the lawyer, being a very bright fella who knows he can say nothing else, well, I would suppose it's the man who actually showed him mercy. And notice what Jesus says. Go and do likewise. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind, all of it. And so may it be for all of us.